Welcome to the Go Red for Women podcast series with Rose Kyola. Hi, my name is Rose Kyola, and I sit on the executive leadership team for the Go Red for Women campaign for the American Heart Association. Every 80 seconds, a woman will die from heart disease or stroke, and yet most of these incidences are preventable by making healthy, smart lifestyle changes like diet and exercise. All women deserve to live a long, meaningful life, and that's why I advocate for women's health by being a part of the American Heart Association. Go Red for Women helps women recognize that heart disease is their number one killer. We've created this podcast series to educate you on what it means to live a healthy lifestyle and how to get there. We've partnered with doctors and experts to give you the information how to achieve those goals to live that healthy lifestyle. You'll hear from survivors firsthand on how they got into those situations and how they broke free and changed their life for the better. What you'll gain from this podcast is you'll learn tools, you'll gather resources, and most importantly, you will help build community that you can count on. I'm Rose Kyola, and today I'm so thrilled to have the Lieutenant Governor Kathleen Hochul here with us on our American Heart Association Go Red for Women podcast. Happy Welcome. to be here. This is great. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, so tell us, you got into politics at a very young age. What inspired you to go along that path? You know, I was raised by a family, you know, very humble circumstances. My parents started married life living in a trailer park, and my dad worked at the steel plant. They worked very hard, but I grew up in an, an environment that was very socially conscious. Even though we didn't have a lot, my parents always taught us that there's people who have less than we do. So we would help kids from the, you know, the inner city, take them up to parks. And there were a lot of kids, children of migrant workers who had come up from Puerto Rico, and we started a summer camp for them. And, we're always helping people, bringing kids with disabilities into our home. Even when we had a modest home ourselves, and we used to get our clothes at the used clothing store, but we still thought we had a lot. So I think my responsibility in growing up in that environment was figuring out my way to give back to society. My parents weren't in politics, but they were very involved in, in the community. So I view politics as the vehicle to do good for other people through government. Politics is the avenue to get into government. So I thought my career would be working for people who run for office and helping behind the scenes and maybe working as a senator, you know, for a senator or a congressman someday. Never envisioning myself in that role myself. I was going to be the behind the scenes person. And in high school, mm -hmm. I worked on Senator Moynihan's first run for office. And I worked for everybody running from local government up to governor and realized that you know maybe later on in life I had something to give myself and decided to run. But it was after a lot of years of giving to others as well. So politics was really my way to better the lives of other people. And today, that's really still what drives me. And you're sending quite a message out. So thank you for that. Now, you sh can you share a little bit about your mother? She suffered with cardiovascular disease since she at a very young age. She was, it was 25 years ago this year, I was uh, thinking, reflecting that uh, she was 57 and she had raised uh, six kids. And my mom was, um, an incredible person. She endured a lot of hardship when she was younger. Her father walked out and abandoned her and her mother when she was very young. Her mother died when she was 16 and she had to raise all these stepkids and she couldn't go on to college until she was 40 years old because she had all these responsibilities. So she had a tough life, but she was so loving and so giving. And she raised this big family and taught all of us responsibility, but she also started other, issue, uh, other causes. She became a, an advocate for victims of domestic violence way back in the 70s when they were called battered women. No one even spoke about them. They were really in the shadows. So my mother worked for them. and She worked as a, uh, a suicide counselor. and She did so much. But I realized over the years, I think a lot of that took a toll on her. She was so giving, but not, never really took care of herself. She was the one who people called on late at night. And she was so emotionally wrapped up in the lives of her children and her grandkids and people in the community that I think she you know, putting herself second or third or fourth really made, left her vulnerable to something like heart disease. And she was of a generation where nobody exercised. You know, women, girls didn't play sports. You know, she grew up in a family where you know we had you know, spam sandwiches and pancakes for dinner a lot. You know, she had to take what food we had and make make a stretch. We weren't eating healthy. 
They didn't know any better. Right. But but I'm sure they also couldn't afford it either. We didn't have expensive food available. Nobody was eating, you know, you know, arugula salads or anything. It was just a different world. And most people grew up like that, you know, you know, middle class and lower middle class families. You just made a big bowl of goulash and hope it stretched to feed a family of eight. So I would say her lifestyle was not healthy, but her heart was huge. I mean, she was always giving other people. So, so when she had a heart attack, I mean, this is so, so symptomatic of what we would do. Right. She. You said something earlier yeah. that, to, yeah, and, and I really want the audience to hear this. She this said something was, earlier about how, what was her attitude when she had that heart well, attack? Well, she felt something wasn't right. And she was experiencing a heart attack. I'm in town, she doesn't call me, she doesn't call my father. She literally drives herself, you know, from our town, over a bridge, past the steel plant, into the city, into the hospital, pulls into the parking lot and presents herself. And they immediately took her to the OR, said she had four blocked arteries, had emergency uh, open heart surgery the next day. And but did, we, so did you know? We were she went to the hospital, so she was diagnosed. We were, we so when did she, at what point did she call you? Did she call I think you? My father called me. I mean, at some point, he was trying to. We used to cell phones. We don't need a cell phone. Right. You know, where's mom? You know, mom's in the hospital. I guess the hospital got hold of my father at work. So I, I contrast that with a case where a, a male friend of mine just was playing tennis a, a couple months ago. He felt some symptoms. He immediately told his friend to take him to a large hospital in Rochester, and on the way there, my friend realized that he was in distress and said, go to this closer healthcare facility that's uh, just around the corner, and that decision literally saved his life. It turned out he was in distress. They brought him back after you know, resuscitation, and he had been on, on the sidewalk. They pulled him out of the car and, said, and they started uh, performing all kinds of procedures on him to bring him back. He said he would have died if he had not made that decision. Think about my mother who doesn't want to bother anybody. Right, which is typical me. of most women in how we think. That's right? how we are. And right. I, I was hoping that would end with my mother's generation where they don't really think of themselves, they think of everybody else. And right. I'm the next generation. Hopefully I'd be more enlightened having seen what my mother went through. And hopefully my daughter, uh, millennial daughter, would say, you know what, of course I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to exercise. You know, because my life has value. And women for throughout history you know, on themselves and their health. And I want that to change. You know, I, I have an 18-year-old daughter, and just recently I've always been an advocate for take care of yourself, learn how to do things, and, you know, be aware of your diet and your exercise and, you know, how you're feeling. I mean, she just turned 18, and it's, it's, been, a, it's been a journey, but I could say that now, which she never understood before, and I could say now that she's finally getting it because, you know, she's asking more questions. She's focused more on her health mm -hmm. um, and what, you know, foods are good for her and not good for her and her heart and exercising. So I feel like now it's paid off a little bit, all of my badgering, you know, but it is, it's different. It's difficult because it's, you know, we come from this primitive way of thinking and it's so hard for women, even in today's world, to get out of that frame of thinking. Right. So, you know... Uh, we're hoping that this podcast will really inspire women to, to move forward, to step forward and, and take more of initiative for their health and, and well-being and mental well-being. You know, and I think a lot of women live in food deserts. They live in an area where there's not access to healthy foods. At the state, we're trying to change that. We're trying to allow you to use your supplemental nutrition you know, tickets, your food stamps be able to go into farmers markets and to buy fresh produce and, and teach kids and families how to cook healthier. So these, there's a lot of state initiatives that are recognizing that culturally you may not have grown up this way, but there is a better way for you and your family. And when you teach kids at a young age what healthy food is and they, that's all they know growing up, that's how they're going to be for their children. So we can change the culture around this with each, each individual family of women who are willing to change. But I also can't expect every woman to have a gym membership. I mean, this is expensive, but that's not the only way to exercise. Right. I get out on my bike. I take a walk. You know, I just sit on my hotel room floor and do stretches and sit-ups and just try to keep active. And I think that's the lesson, too. It doesn't have to be expensive and for the privileged only to be able to eat healthy and exercise and take care of yourself. It's for everybody. It's for everyone. And that's why especially with your schedule, I'm sure, <laughs> you, you have to squeeze it in at certain times. So we know how important caregivers are to someone who's experienced cardiovascular disease or stroke, both physically and emotionally. So as a caregiver, 
Did you change any of your habits, like exercise, diet, conversations with the doctor, stress management? Like, how were you when you were younger compared to now? Completely different. You know, I was not athletic in school. You know, my generation, we all want watch my my brothers were super athletes and. The whole family would go watch my brothers play sports, and we sat on the sidelines. My sister and I would just watch the boys play. So we were not even physically active. And as I mentioned before, we ate all the food my mom made, but it was just whatever she could get cheaply in large volumes. And so um, after I saw my mother go through that, and I was her person, you know, I, I took care of her. I took her to all of her follow-up. I took her to rehab. Uh, it was winter time, and we had to go mall walks and try to find indoor places to walk. I realized the importance of getting my mom back in shape, but meanwhile I was next to her. I wasn't going to go have a hot fudge Sunday sitting next to my mother who was trying to restrict her, her uh, diet to be healthier. So I think that was a turning point for me as well because I wasn't raised to be in a healthy environment. And you know, I lost weight since you know, that time and I've tried to put a premium on exercise but also realizing the connection between mental health and physical health. And so much of Physical health is related to your your stress levels, and much of what women deal with is out of their control, whether they're getting harassed at work or stressed out about childcare and all the pressures of balancing family and, and keeping spouses or partners happy, but also we have a boss that's waiting for them and the kids who's making sure the homework's done. All that weight falls on women's shoulders. So more than anyone, they should be taking steps of like you know, deep breathing and meditation and just calming themselves down and realizing, you know, as my mother used to say, no one can make you feel bad without your permission. Believe me, in my business, there's a lot of negativity, a lot of criticisms, particularly, you know, whether it's on social media, whether it's in a campaign TV ad. So you, how you internalize that, it has a lot to do with your physical health. And that's a lesson that women should feel that they can, one area of their life they can control is how they feel about their lives. And a lot of it's mental, keep the mental positive and it'll have a more positive effect on your overall health, including your heart. Do you have, you being one of the most busiest people in the world, do you have a practice or a way that you balance your um, career, family, home, job, everything else? <laughs> well, I actually have a hashtag called How She Does It, and because I've been asked by everyone, how you manage, I, mean, I got up today at 3 a.m., I won't be finished until late tonight, and started flying in from Buffalo, an event already today, and my typical day is busy to say the least. But I also say, you know, women can do this as well, and I think this is important that they, you know, don't necessarily follow my model, but I do try to insert some exercise in every day, whether I'm just literally on the floor of my hotel room or I find a hotel gym. I, I ride my bike, I rode my bike last night. Even if it's, I'm from Buffalo, if it's 35 degrees out, I'm probably still on my bike. I'm just dressed warm for you. It's warm, it's, warm, it's a good day. Uh, so, unfortunately, I have a husband who's very health conscious as well. He's a fourth degree black belt, something he, he did later in life as well. Again, never too late to change your life. You may not have grown up with a healthy environment or a culture. Your people in your neighborhood didn't embrace these, these strategies, but you have to look out for yourself, particularly women. You have to say, you know what, at the end of the day, I got to be resilient and be there for others, perhaps, but be there for myself. And putting myself first when it comes to your physical health, your spiritual health, your mental health, is, is all plays into you being a stronger, more resilient person and a better role model for your families. So I personally just try to work in exercise whenever I can, and sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not, but my How She Does It talks about you know the different exercise routines I do, depending on where I am, and how I have to pack, and how I manage stress and negativity when people say mean things to me, how I deal with that. So I try to give pointers to other people because I am in a unique position. Uh, as the highest ranked woman in the state of New York uh, office, I feel I have a, a platform where I can talk about women's health, whether it's heart health or uh, breast cancer awareness, early screening, and just all the different issues we talk about, including you know, hair and opioids. That's another big issue I work on is uh, the crisis that we're experiencing where so many families have had to endure the pain of seeing a loved ones succumb to this, including my own, losing a nephew. So I just try to tell my story and what I've overcome, but also I take inspiration from hearing the stories of survivors and other strong women. Uh, that's, what, that's what energizes me. So how she does it. Hashtag how she does it. I'm going to follow that for sure. Everyone else should as well. <clears throat> what advice do you have for women who put their health on the back burner? 
don't. Stop doing it. Because in the long run, if you're not there for your family, what good will it have served? He had lost my mother um, at that time when she was not taking care of herself and she, you know, she succumbed to heart disease at the time. You know, she, she was re re rehabilitated and brought back. Uh, she would have been there to see my daughter get married or see all these milestones. And so it's, it's so important that you take care of yourself because if you are putting your family first, which women intuitively do, it's an innate in our, in our nature. Yes, that's nice, but if you don't take care of yourself first, you may not make it. You may not survive a, a disease that comes on because of your unhealthy lifestyle or because you're too stressed out. So don't let that take your life over. You want to be there for your family and your loved ones. So take care of yourself first, and you have more of a guarantee you will be. I love it. See, I, I, I won't put my health on the back burner, I promise. Um, so, I mean, is there anything that we have not talked about that you would like to talk about? Well, I just want to say that in the state of New York, we believe that health care is a right and is a huge priority. And with the expansion of Medicaid and programs that we've enacted, more women have health care options available to them. And so instead of just waiting to go to the emergency room when you're really sick, people now have health care through the state of New York that allows them to have preventative care. Go for those checkups. Go every year and ask, you know, see what your blood pressure is. You need to be on some medicine that could, that could thwart a future heart attack. You can do, take steps now that maybe in the past you couldn't have because you live in the state of New York. Governor Cuomo and I are very committed to making sure that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care, and so you have no excuses. Now, you're working on some other major, major projects, especially involving women and LGBT rights. Is there something you want to say about that? Yes, this is a huge priority for us, particularly with, the, with what's happening in Washington. Uh, the assault on the transgender community, for example. I'm very proud that we just passed the, a law that outlaws discrimination based on gender identity. We just got that done a couple months ago. Women's rights, we just codified, you know, signed into law the rights enshrined under Roe v. Wade because with the Congress we have, with the President we have, with the Supreme Court we have, we don't know what's going to happen to those rights. So I want people to know in the state that we take our responsibility as a leader for the rest of the nation when it comes to women's health care, reproductive health, quality child care, equal pay, eradicating sexual harassment in the workforce, which we just uh, are working very aggressively on, and also the pay gap that still exists in society today. Here in New York, it's one of the smallest gender gaps between what a woman makes and a man makes, but we also just took the step to ban the salary history question, which if you think about it, if an employer asks a woman what her previous salary was and she wasn't successful in negotiating her past jobs, what she's really worth, she's always going to make less money than the man. So we don't even allow employers to ask that question. It's just signed to law and we celebrated the homecoming of the women's uh, world champion soccer team this past week. So, so we're doing a lot of good things for people, but you have power over one thing in particular, and that is your own life. And the decisions you make will affect you and your families for a long time. That's right, and it's not just your health, it's your emotional health and well-being, and your life. And it's it's time, right? We're Absolutely. in the age now, it's time. It is time. High five. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. My wish for you is that you learn the skills to make the changes in your life that you wish to make. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. For more information, please visit Go Red for Women dot org or heart dot org. See you next time.